Whether you have a diagnosis or not, I don't care. I'll teach you how to find what's causing your health struggles using the blood work you already have right here on this podcast, but also in my new book, Why Are My Labs Normal? Go grab it on Amazon and let me know you love it and appreciate the knowledge by leaving a review for the book and for this podcast. This podcast is sponsored by my favorite supplement companies, Systemic Formulas and My Bio. Come join me inside their private Facebook group for practitioners called Systemic Formulas Clinical Nutrition. For everybody else, go join them on Instagram at Systemic Formulas. All right, let's get started. Welcome to the Beyond the Diagnosis podcast with me, Dr. Kylie. We're going to talk about gut today but we're going to learn more about the gut and this term we call SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, than you have ever wondered beforehand. And if you thought about taking a probiotic, you might want to listen in. Dr. Melanie is a naturopath. Um, She's here to teach us four things we don't know about gut problems. But first, Dr. Melanie, thanks, of course, thanks for having, joining me on today. And uh, walk us through a little bit of your journey and how you got from where you are today and this gut specialist next to your name. Well, I'm the, it happened to me story. I mean, I'm the child who suffered with even constipation and then never ending trying to figure that out. My poor mother trying to figure that out. Right. And then landing in naturopathic medical school where my mentor had a preceptorship where you had to go through preceptorship hours. And I literally won the lottery to, um, with a preceptorship with him. And, um, he just happened to have written a book, functional gastroenterology and had this section about SIBO that he had researched and Allison Seebecker had just read his book and they were connecting and, you know, really, geeking out about that subject. And it just so happened when I was graduating, it just all the, I'll call it the stars aligned. And so I was invited to join the SIBO center as it was in development, even as we were like, should we even call it this? Like, because it was pretty underground, you know, at the time, but Allison happened to reach out to Dr. Mark Pimentel um, and we had held our first SIBO symposium and he was stunned because he, we had 500 people and he's like, who are you people? You know, <laughs> and we were just thrilled that he came from, you know, fancy LA to, to uh, Portland and we did it all out. We had a low FODMAP dinner, you know, it was, it was all in style. So that's how I landed in in SIBO specifically, I'll say got in the tube. Um, And by way of me also having it and myself and coming to the meetings that we'd hold weekly, you know, Allison might've had her input. I'd have my input on what we were discussing with diets or herbs or always following um, the evidence as well, because we had access to the research team at Cedar. So that gave me access to thousands of breath tests and hundreds of cases and Examples. Yeah, breath test, the famous test for testing for SIBO. <laughs> yeah. Um, you said you were in Portland. Is that where you are? Uh, I'm here in LA now. I actually moved here because of, of those connections. Um, but at the time, yeah, I, I lived and stayed in after graduation in Portland. You know, at the time that was like natural medicine, anyone in Portland, Oregon. Yes, <laughs> and, right? and then I was like, I was this one who was bringing up SIBO and people were like, what are you talking about? It was even as an intern doing our hours, I would go to my, you know, my attending physicians and they wouldn't, some of them would deny me doing a breath test. They're like, Oh no, no, we don't need that. In this case, we're going to do herbs or which was great. But I was like, if we had a breath test, we could see how the herbs work, you know? So I went to school in Portland too. And it was like every corner, there's a naturopath and chiropractor (laughs) and (laughs) they go there before they go to anybody else. And even in Oregon, as a, as a chiropractic physician in Oregon, you can do midwifery, you can do um, small surgeries, you can do all sorts of things there. Yeah. Whereas like the state above Washington, you get like your hands tied behind your back and you get to adjust and that's about it. So it's just very different upon the licensure of each state. But because Oregon was so open, we had to take all those courses. We had to take a gynecology, a urology, and perform those kind of exams where I was like, I have to do what? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't go to med school or become an MD for a reason, you know? 
Yeah. I had to perform a gynecology exam and a urology exam and, and small surgery and all that stuff in chiropractic school. So it always catches people off guard. Like, wait, you don't just crack back and next. Like, actually, I don't do that at all. I'm all functional medicine. I gave up the table a long time ago because there are so many people who suffer with these chronic issues like gut issues where bloating is just normal to them. And this term we call SIBO, which is a overall term for gut problems, but mostly bloating, constipation, diarrhea. You're the expert. What do we need to know about SIBO? Well, I, I kind of am, I don't mean to be sassy, but I might come across sassy because I've just seen what I've seen. So oftentimes I'll say, how's that working for you? So if you've been, if you're new to this and you've been like, Hey, I've never tried that, then that's one thing, you know? And then also I'm going to bring up some things that if you've been, I call it running in the hamster wheel, doing everything that everyone says to do about SIBO, then you might want to just put on a, you know, little I call it a grain of potassium on <laughs> listening to what I'm about to say, because I actually recommend people stop probiotics and, um, and that can, that's, that's number one, guys. <laughs> that's number Our one. one, thing, number one. Yep, probiotics are not for everybody. Thank you. Correct. I'm not, not saying that probiotics themselves aren't great, but outside taking them in other forms or in foods we can take have our whole grain foods and our right our very diversified foods that we eat that then become probiotic by way of nature that that i encourage right um, but if you've been chasing the it's this strain it's that strain it's this combo um, and again you are still having you know gut health issues then i say pause the probiotics. Number people one. have a hard time with this because I, I have this process with gut that I help people with. And, and a lot of it is chronic diarrhea, chronic constipation, bloating, indigestion, food sensitivities, all the things. Mm -hmm. And we, we, if you want to call it tackle the SIBO, we get rid of the bad bacteria. And really it's this concept of, I mean, you explain it. What is, what is SIBO in your words? What's happening? Oh, okay. So this is how I describe it. We know now with certainty that food poisoning can cause what I call a skip in the record. So if people are old enough to remember albums, that's where music came from. <laughs> um, so you can have a skip in the record and depending on how deep the skip in the record is, that's actually a test that we get. That's one of my four to educate people on, look, if you have a higher number, a higher marker here, an antibody, and you're going to have a deeper groove in the record. So therefore the record's going to skip. You might have to get up. You might have to move the needle. You might have to do more things, right? That means space your meals, yada, 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 eat lower foot. Like you might have more, I call it rules that everyone might be aware of around SIBO, because if you have that skip in the record, that slows down your motility of the foods and all of the nutrients and things that are happening in the small intestine, that the bacteria, if they get trapped in this compartment, I kind of give an analogy of like, if it's just people at the wrong compartment or the wrong ballroom of the wedding. And so they're crowding this area where it's just like, nope, you just need to go through those doors through the ileocecal valve and go into the large intestine where you are welcome. Come have a party. Okay. Because these are not bad bacteria. These are not pathogenic. These are not causing illness or this is not an infection. These are good guys in the wrong compartment. What can cause that compartment to get full is the skip in the record. So we want to measure with a dead I've blood. I've explain like that and it's brilliant. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Like, wait, because I, I just say bad guys and good guys. And that's, you're telling me it's wrong for one. They're good guys in the wrong spot. Yeah, because even the antibiotic that's used is not antibiotic as in broad spectrum, which you can use broad spectrum antibiotics. You can, that is part of the algorithm. However, the one that people know of and kind of gets its claim to fame and it also has its price tag is eubiotic. So it's just take, yes, it's killing these, right? Gram negative bacteria, but there are friends in the large intestine, right? And they go, sorry, you guys can't live here. We're going to get rid of you. And that antibiotic, eubiotic, 
turns into a probiotic once it goes through the large intestine, the pH shifts. And then once it's in the large intestine, it repopulates lactobacillus and bifida. Hence why we don't need a probiotic. And hence why we also wait two weeks before we retest the blood breath test because the rifaximin can remain in the stool for up to two weeks. Okay, did you guys catch that? Because <laughs> she had two golden nuggets in that. One, probiotics. And I have this conversation with so many people. Well, when can I start taking probiotics? Because it's so ingrained in our heads from everybody saying we have to have a probiotic for healthy gut. Wrong. If we go off of a probiotic and you feel better, there's probably a reason why. You don't need to take one again. Two, the concept of when to test. If you're using the breath test, which is a standard analysis for SIBO, you can't do it after two weeks of taking the antibiotic. Well, I'm just giving, I'm always about the evidence, right? So I just like to be able to know that's why it is stated in the papers that way. And then also being around the research team, right? I've, I've, sat at the tables with that, you know, so this it's is your thing. Yeah. Oh, it's like, okay, I've, I can read it this way, but then I also have patient in front of me who's like, I don't want to wait two weeks, you know, where are they still having symptoms? Right. So that's the clinician's choice to then, right. Make a change. Or if somebody's done the elemental formula, I refer to it as formula versus a diet, but if somebody's done elemental diet, they may then want to test right away subsequently, because they might either continue that elemental diet is like strict right so it is intense don't be just don't be google searching elemental diet and please. doing this on your own this is intense stuff yes thank you for emphasizing that that unfortunately happens yes, yes a lot okay number one don't need probiotics number two stomach acid talk to us about the acid levels of our stomach and why we're told the wrong things because we are <laughs> well, we just don't want to assume that it's due to low stomach acid. That gets a lot of claim to fame. And proton pump inhibitors or medications that reduce our stomach acid get this assumption that it is a risk factor or if not a cause of SIBO. And that has been ruled out. That has been ruled out. I attended D Digestive Disease Week, which is an international conference that was shown there in 2019. And they're also going to have more studies about that presenting this year as well. So they've really been able to show. However, what I know about motility, because as we discussed, we have a skip in the record that is we're actually measuring is part three or phase three of what's called the migrating motor complex. So phase three is downstream. Having grown up in Alaska, I know like you have where the fish spot, right? So you want to go, where does my money, <laughs> i.e. when you're a fishing family, start from? And it starts from upstream. So motility starts in the stomach. And I'm showing my fist because our stomach is average the size of our fist. And that is phase one of motility is stomach empty. So when the stomach empties, then it's going to move along. Phase three is where we're looking at, do I have a skip in the record? That's where you're already problematic. The overgrowth is likely happening. Maybe even that bloating is happening. But upstream, if we're checking for the stomach, we can see because the stomach doesn't want to empty properly. This hatch isn't going to open if it's too low or too high. It's got to be Goldilocks just right for the stomach to empty. So that is the really phase one of it all. And you can see a lot of people have talked about vagal stimulation because vagus nerve is stimulating, you know, is innervating the stomach and gargling and all these things that can say, you know, but again, I'm like, I don't care how much you stimulate <laughs> with the nerve, the parasympathetic sympathetic systems. If that pH isn't right, as we also know in physiology is not going to open. Okay. So I actually believe that we're having like an overgrowth in the stomach. Why? Because these parietal cells in the stomach are pumping off hydrochloric acid, HCL, right. To break things down. And if we have those parietal cells, which I'm also going to test for, they're pumping off this extra hydrogen. Well, hydrogen is one of the gases measured on the breath tests. Methane is actually the archaea, but that is actually for hydrogen. 
And then you have hydrogen sulfide, the new kid on the block that everybody should be measuring in their breath tests, but maybe that's another thing people might not know that they need, is hydrogen sulfide is looking for five. So if you have these stomach acid cells that are just popping out, I call them little Miss Pac-Man, they're just making these Pac-Man pellets of extra hydrogen. And that is actually an excess of hydrochloric acid, not a low stomach acid problem. So when you have people who assume they have low stomach acid, then they start taking HCL, <laughs> they're just contributing, they may be contributing a hydrogen. Now, what I have seen is maybe people's constipation gets oh, better for a moment. I was one of these people, trust me, I've taken the HCL, but then it gets, doesn't improve. And sometimes it even gets worse. And so that's where, again, you want to say, or you even see their methane go up. And now I'll say, are you taking betaine HCL? Number one, are you taking a probiotic? Number two, are you taking betaine HCL? Because you may be contributing your hydrogen by way of hydrochloric acid. Yeah, just knowing the chemistry behind that makes sense with all the And it also tests a hundred stomachs because people might read, oh, there's a baking soda burping test. Oh, there's a string test. And then there's the gold standard, which is called a Heidelberg pH test. And to give you some statistics, I've done over a hundred, but I like to give people a hundred stomach, you know, pH tests. And out of a hundred, like one person takes a hundred different tests. No, I'm saying if I've out of patients, a hundred of them have taken this pH test, okay. Heidelberg's gold standard. Uh -huh. Five of them had low stomach, like it's called hidden hypochlorhydria. Because having not enough stomach acid or a chlorhydria, that's very rare. That's an autoimmune condition. That's a problem. This is hidden. So there's enough stomach acid when it lands, when the capsule lands in the stomach, it's when a challenge is given that the stomach acid cells or parietal cells are slow to reacidify. So that again will affect motility from phase one, from it just even leaving the stomach. So basically the gut is a lot more complicated than we make a seem. <laughs> yes. There's some, there some underlying layers that people don't address and that you're not gonna address with a Google search. You ain't gonna find it, which is why you need an expert like Dr. Melanie. Where can they find you and learn more about you? Um, Intuitive Edge Doctor, that is my current website. And I also have SIBO Solution, singular.com. Okay, cool. All right. That's number two. Number three, food poisoning. So as I touched on before, food poisoning, we now know is the underlying cause that we're, we're even saying of IBS. And this has been done through studies, even with the military that has shown that it's not stress. It didn't have anything relate to combat, you know, like they really ruled out the proverbial big bold letters of stress. Um, it is indeed food poisoning and they're even referring to it as post-infectious IBS. So I mentioned I was shadowing at Cedars for a time and there was a, I won't, there was a fast food restaurant that had an incident and the entire team just like lit up like, oh, this, you know, it was like, you never seen something so exciting. And they said, to the emergency, you know, anybody who comes in with food poisoning, like, or cause it can also be abdominal pain, um, please provide this test. And so the point here is, and now it turned out that that food incident was viral. It was not bacterial. So you, we can talk about a food poisoning that's viral and that's self-limiting, meaning it'll just, you'll have it and then it'll, it'll pass. And as, as will a bacterial as well, but some can lead to hospitalizations in both situations, right? But the point is, is that usually these resolve, then they can leave behind this toxin. And so the top five bacterial food poisoning culprits leave behind this toxin, and that's what we're measuring in the blood test. So we're looking to see, do we have an antibody to this toxin that was left? And it can say, yes, you've had a food poisoning, but your body's not having an autoimmune response to it. That autoimmune response is what I'm looking for and referring to as the skip in the record. How often do you see auto, uh, food poisoning as like the starter? If we, if we were to think about what causes, would you say 50% of the time it's a big factor on why these 
Well, it's always based on somebody's history, right? So somebody can, there's, there's other like risk factors for having SIBO and, and they're pretty, I wouldn't say un, not common, like endometriosis or a, sur- a history of surgical, you know, maybe you've had abdominal surgery that can cause adhesion. You know, there's other things as to why somebody might have persistent SIBO. If it's this, I've had everything tested, especially a stool test, then I'll say, have you ever had your, <laughs> you know, have you ever read this test? And I will say that with re- courtesy and respect to the researchers, they really specify you test the diarrheal patients because this is 98% sensitive and specific. Like it's very, very, and this is, this, you know, you're not um, questioning IBD here. They have set the standards that this is definitely not, you're not going to miss an IBD case. If this is positive for for either the antibodies to the toxin or to this um, migrating motor complex nerve, then it is officially IBS and you do not continue on with your right diagnosis of exclusion. So this is another way that it saves people a lot of money. Um, if anybody- This is a different test than our GI stool tests that were, are so common. Correct. Yeah. So it's like, if this is it, if you have, and it just came back, actually a patient I've been working with for years and they had an incident and I was like, you know what? I, this sounds like food poisoning. And they actually dismissed it as food poisoning, but I waited the 21 days around for, you know, until the antibody would be a bit stronger. And I was like, okay, I think we should test for this. Now they were better. We did our SIBO magic, you know, and it was like, they had a little skip in the, you know, a little blip. They had to travel. They were like, we got to fix this. It got handled. Meanwhile, the test came back positive for both antibodies. Now they're feeling great. No problems, no motility issues. And we're just going to stay the course. However, if somebody is, I've been through the running through this hamster wheel forever and they came back positive, I'd be like, well, there you go. Now we have a reason. Now we have something we can address. How do you address food poisoning? Well, we address the fact that this is now an autoimmune condition. See, this is so I, I love this stuff because I learned so much. <laughs> you have the smart people on like you, and I'm like, wow, this is like changing the way I treat the gut too. Oh, yeah. Number four. Okay. Know your genes. The term we like to call epigenetics, but know your yeah. genes. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's best. Um, so for example, let's go back to, I was talking about the stomach acid cells that can make Pac-Man pellets. Those are called parietal cells. So I like to measure the parietal cells as a blood test. And I also measure what's called intrinsic factor. And it's actually, there's a binding and a blocking antibody, but it's, you really can't find the blocking so much as the, excuse me, the binding as much as the blocking. So it's more of the like, worst case scenario is what I'll I'll call it. And then I'll also direct people to a particular one lab over the other, because one has a reference range zero to 1.1 and the other will just give me positive or negative. So I found this pattern that was interesting. So I'm looking at the stomach, right? And I'm saying, I'm looking at why there's excess stomach acid or, right. And um, finding that people were coming back with an intrinsic factor. So that means that their ability to absorb B12 is blocked. So their intrinsic factor out of 0.0 to 1.1 was like 1.1 or 1.0. But whereas the other lab would have called it, you know, negative, this lab is giving me the reference range. So I was able to see how many people were right on the edge of the reference range and just a bit of methyl cobalamin or various forms of cobalamin, depending on people's genes that are happening in a particular pathway. I found that that would really change the situation. Sometimes it was pretty miraculous, honestly, how, um, in fact, one case, it was a textbook pernicious anemia case, like pretty severe, very, very elevated antibodies. Anyone in any medical school would be like, whoa, that's pernicious anemia. We then healed or fixed or however, whatever term you want to use the SIBO addressed the issue, which actually, interestingly enough, was a low acid case. And yet we then retested those antibodies negative as if that autoimmune condition no longer exists. And that need for inter, you know, intramuscular B12 
is no longer forever. Isn't that interesting? So that's what say I that, mean. Say that one more time. <laughs> so this case could, um, technically hidden hypochlorhydria, positive, OHCL. positive antibodies for parietal cells and intrinsic factor blocking. And that, and that means what? That means B12 is not being absorbed. Okay. And people would like to blame that with MTHFR. Correct. That's like the misnomer. Don't just jump to that conclusion kind of thing. That's another thing. Correct. Yeah. However, <laughs> because there's MTHFR in the folate pathway, I'm going to nerd out here. There are multiple steps before you even get to MTHFR. Yes. So I just like to say, well, you know, we want to flood that pathway with dark leafy greens if we can, hopefully um, well tolerated. Um, but then, yeah, so exactly. But the, I would always show people actually have this poster. <laughs> I would like get up there and be a teacher and be like, here you go. And here's why this is getting blocked. And subsequently why you're having issues with amino acid acids. And, and that can land in melatonin, right? That's going to be your sleep, your anxiety, et cetera. Because if some, if chicken lands in your stomach, and it isn't broken down properly by the stomach acid and then subsequently going through the system motility wise, you're going to have an excess amino acid that's larger. And if you have that little extra protein that has some extra, the immune system is going to say, Hey, that's not self that's chicken. It's not, you know, it's not these amino acids that I need. It's, it's a little extra. And so it's going to go into an alarm state. So if we just, and that's where all these food sensitivities will ease. I've seen people with interstitial cystitis no longer have interstitial cystitis, you know, like literally the diagnosis is concluded. Goes away. That's what I like to hear. <laughs> it's all about that. Yeah. So... So probiotics, not necessarily need them. Stomach acid, pay attention. Food poisoning could have been the big culprit. Um, and then know, to know your genes and see not only what you're predisposed to, but is there a big factor on your genetics playing a role inside the gut health and the B vitamins? Well, and it goes into vitamin D and bile. I mean, I'm looking at multi multiple gene pathways, but MTHFR is the NB12 is kind of more well known. But yeah, that that's the reason why it, it's for me. It's also a test that you have lifelong, right? I'm always gonna if I know my genes, that's forever, and then I can work with what I do in my lifestyle, etc., and with my doctor on on that. And and I will say, some people might be smarter than their doctors on that, so give them a little time. <laughs> And then some of us really like it. And, and I know it's the future. How many tests are you doing with a patient? Pardon? How many how tests? How many tests do you take like per patient? Uh, ooh. Maybe five, top five. Okay. That's, that's still not bad. But you're getting so much more information on why you know, everything else they've tried hasn't worked. Yeah. And that's me going into specialty with five. I would say the blood test, the breath test, your epigen, your genes. And then from there, I, we've had significant improvement. And then depending on the situation, we might have to look at mold or environmental toxins. Um, but typically from there, I, I really want to enhance and teach people about their epi, you know, about how, cause there's another test where we can look at how they're aging, how, you know, cellular the market, exactly how their methylation, which is, these are the word, you know, how is they, how are they actually? Yeah. So <laughs> having a healthy gut doesn't just mean go take a probiotic. In fact, it may mean stop taking your probiotics. <laughs> it might mean so that. Yes. <laughs> you have any questions and concerns or you're like, you know what? I'm just going to go see the best. Go see Dr. Melanie. You can find her at intuitiveedgedoctor.com. And one final question, actually, Let's do this first. Give me the your favorite story to tell about a patient transformation. Oh, and I have permission on this one. Um, a younger gentleman came to me, 6'2", 135 pounds, um, was doing all the right things, right? Bone broths, carrot, like just all the right things, actually eating quite high fat and losing weight. <clears throat> 
And um, again, it's interesting that I'm going to bring up another low stomach acid case, but there's only five. That's why they're so memorable. <laughs> okay. Out of a hundred stomachs, five of them technically had this low stomach acid. So it was, that's how I learned, wow, this is more like it, it is a huge turnaround or it's not the right thing. Does that make sense? And um, so he, I even have video testimonial from him of like his, him experiencing food again. And how he's like, you told me to eat a potato and my body like woke up and lit up. And like, I felt like I could function again. And I'll never forget when he messaged me, um, can I eat a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? And I was like, oh yeah. And he's like, gluten, you know, like big capital letters. And I was like, yeah. Cause I, I knew he was touring his music producer and you know, I didn't want, I didn't want it to be restrictive. I wanted him to just have whatever he was, you know, and he just oh, he said, be able to love and enjoy food again and not see food yes. as the enemy. He said he got tearful. He was like, you have no idea how nostalgic that was just that you. And he's like that. I didn't have to go find gluten-free bread that I could just make the sandwich that I was like drooling of making right in front of me. And I was like, did you, and he was like, it was, I think I ate the whole loaf. Right. And in two months he was up 25 pounds. And, um, you know, and he calls himself a foodie now. And even to this day, like I, I check in on people. That's why it's nice to have that epigenetic and the, like, let's keep things fabulous. Um, don't always want to see people who have spiraled or fallen off the seat, you know, cause I'm like, well, we don't always have to get back on this SIBO hamster or SIFO or keep, I call it the, the whack-a-mole. You know, it's yeast, it's mold, it's the, <laughs> it's like, what's the underlying cause of all of us? That's what we want. And, and I love that story that he went from not eating anything and being terrified to eat anything to like, wait a second, you mean I can eat this gluten bread right here and it's not going to kill me? Yeah. Yeah. That's my kind of GI doctor right there. Yeah, thank you. All right, Dr. Natalie, if, or Melody, sorry. I don't know why I said Natalie. Melanie, um, if you were to lose everything, your entire practice and have to start over, mm -hmm. what would you do? Acquire. I would acquire a business. Um, I would acquire or acquire a Facebook group. You can acquire assets. You can acquire a podcast and you can actually do this with no money out of pocket. I know that sounds kind of salesy, but I've actually learned about this and it's by way of having relationships, by being in your network, having, um, you know, a skill that you can offer. You can even consult for equity into businesses, um, but you can also acquire them completely. Now that is a golden nugget. People are always like, well, you have to have money to make money. No, you don't. You got to be creative. And that's being creative. So very interesting thought. And I'm just going to leave it at that because we could dive in a whole lot, but that's too much golden nuggets. So we'll leave it at that. All right. Thanks, Dr. Melody. Thanks for coming on and joining us and just dumping your knowledge. You guys, again, if you have any struggles with your gut and you're sick and tired of eating nothing, go see Dr. Melanie at intuitiveedgedoctor.com. Wasn't that just loads of gold? Keep the gold coming by grabbing my book on Amazon. Why are my labs normal? Go grab it. Let me know you love it and appreciate the knowledge by leaving a review, both for the book and for this podcast. Share it on your social media too. I'm here to help. Dr. Kylie.